Hey, thank you uh, for joining us. Uh, this is uh, online spectronic seminar number 79. Our speaker today is uh, Professor Yuri Makarusov uh, from Forschung Centrum Jülich and uh, um, Johannes Gutenberg University uh, of Mainz. He has earned his master's degree at the National Technical University of Ukraine in Kiev in 2001 and a PhD at Ulich in 2006, where he focused on DFT studies of magnetism and one-dimensional systems. And then after postdoctoral appointments at the University of Hamburg and at UC Berkeley, he became a leader of a young investigator group at Ulich in 2009, uh, where he worked uh, since then. Um, and. Uh, more recently, since uh, 2018, he is an associate professor at the uh, Johannes Gutenberg University of Mainz and the head of the topological nanoelectronics group uh, in Mainz and Ulich, which, as he said, has kept its name since 2009. And the focus of his research is in spin orbit driven physics, topological effects in solids, magnetotransport and DFT-based methodologies for response and dynamical properties of magnets. So the topic of his talk today is spin chirality, a topological variable of magnetic materials. And um, I look forward to your talk. Yuri, take it away. Yep. Absolutely. Um, so should I start? Yes, please, go ahead. Thanks a lot, Kirill. And um, um, let me... Just a sec, I just remove your faces. Okay, perfect. And then I have a laser pointer. Um, so thanks a lot for uh, giving me a chance to, to talk about our results uh, in this seminar series. And uh, I will try to start slowly with the introduction uh, so that more people join of those who are still kind of on the way. And today I'm going to talk about spin chirality and I will try to underline its evasive, but at the same time robust topological origin or its, its nature and how we can exploit it in different contexts. Now, when we talk in spintronics or when we consider different things in spintronics, normally we think about collinear magnets or this has been situation until recently. These are ferromagnets and anti-ferromagnets. However, there are really a bunch of other states out there such as, for example, spirals or domain walls or canted magnets, about which I'm going to talk about uh, today, which can be characterized, for instance, with vector spin chirality, which is a vector product between pairs of spins. On the other hand, there are also more complicated structures which involve more spins into the definition of what it is, such as, for example, for, for example, frustrated magnets like this one, or even skirmions, many of those can be characterized with the so-called scalar spin chirality, which is given by the scalar product between S and the vector chirality, among other spins, and the quantity which measures the solid angle between triplets of spins. I'm not going to talk today about uh, any sorts of higher order moments which you can discuss and define and try to analyze, but I rather stay with these two simple definitions of chirality because for my purposes, uh, this will be sufficient. Um, you, might, you may ask why chirality actually, what is so nice about it? Um, and there are actually lots of reasons. Uh, there is really a, a zoo of chiral states out there. In, the, in reality. Chiral states can be efficiently manipulated, for instance, by spin orbit torques, and they serve as a playground, fruitful play, playground for novel spin interactions. Chirality is naturally and historically related to the effect of superconductivity, and it serves as a foundation for advanced and or topological concepts. For example, teleportation and entanglement, skirmions, novel topological states, or exotic states of matter, such as chiral spin liquids. Now, when we talk in spintronics about chirality, there is one big problem, and that is the detection of chirality, actually, by spintronics means. By now, or at the current state, we are very good with detecting the magnetization of the sample. And if you think of a sample as a black box, 
we can use different techniques to say what magnetization this black box has. However, the situation with chirality is much more complicated and it is much more ambiguous to say something specific about the chiral state of, of a system uh, uh, which it has. And remember that in spintronics, we're allowed to use perturbation so we can perturb the system by DC electric fields or currents as well as by optical or laser excitations. So how do we do this? How do we detect chirality um, by transport means? And of course, one of the main transport means for detecting anything in magnetic materials is the anomalous Hall effect. And chirality here is not an exclusion. Let's take, for example, the simplest case of antiferromagnets, which have two atoms in the unit cell. So for a long time, we have believed that the anomalous Hall effect does not really exist in collinear antiferromagnets, especially because we have been considering mainly the so-called PT symmetric antiferromagnetic materials. If you complicate things, if you include more spin types into considerations, we also know that non-collinear antiferromagnets offer a rich platform for all sorts of Hall effects. For example, Kaplanar antiferromagnets with spin orbit interactions give rise to anomalous Hall effect. And the same is true for non-Kaplanar antiferromagnets where you don't even need spin orbit interaction to generate an anomalous Hall effect, which is known uh, to some of us as the topological Hall effect. The origin of this topological Hall effect has been brought down to the scalar spin chirality among triplets of spins and topological here just emphasizes the fact that here we couple the dynamics of Bloch electrons in reciprocal space to the non-trivial topology of the spin distribution in the real space. Now, you may ask if everything is so simple, then what are we doing here? And the message actually is that in reality, depending on how complicated your system is, there can be various types of anomalous Hall effect in the same system, which are not necessarily chirality related. And one of the recent discoveries here or suggestions is the so-called crystal Hall effect, which arises already in collinear antiferromagnets, which are not PT symmetric, where the symmetry is lowered. The crystal symmetry allows for this uh, kind of contribution. Okay, I will try to postulate a very simple problem. And um, that is, let's say we have a material with two spins in the unit cell. How on earth can we say anything about the chiral state or counted state of the system by just looking at the anomalous Hall effect? Now, I will analyze this on the example of vector spin chirality because it is really the simplest kind of chirality that we can imagine. We just need two spins to have a non-zero chirality in our system. We define chirality like this, I, I repeat it. And this is a quantity which is proportional to the angle theta between the spins. This is trivial stuff. Let's also take a relatively simple system. This would be, if you speak in terms of models, let's say we have a honeycomb lattice, we have a Rajma spin orbit interaction, that means the inversion symmetry is broken, and we consider two type of states. One of them is the collinear ferromagnet, and this is the picture on the top, and the other one is the collinear antiferromagnet. That's what we start from. Now, what we do is we imprint some chiral states in this, uh, in this system. So we tilt our, our spins by an angle theta, and we do this in one sense here and in one sense here, and this would be the chiral state of plus theta, and we do this for the minus theta, where we have a state of opposite chirality. These two states are fundamentally different because the chirality that they have differs in sign. The same we do for an antiferromagnet. And now what we have to do is a numerical experiment or a Gedanken experiment. We just tune the theta and we look at the response of the anomalous Hall effect. And as we have seen, if the symmetry allows it, and this particular example of honeycomb with Rajma um, is, is such a system, then the dependence of your anomalous Hall conductivity on an angle theta or on the sense of chirality, you could say, can be relatively complicated. So what do we have to do to extract some information from the signal about the chirality of our system? And the crucial step here 
is to do the following decomposition. That is a symmetrization and anti-symmetrization of our conductivity with respect to theta. S stands for symmetrized and A stands for anti-symmetrized. And the first part is the symmetric signal. It is the signal which does not care about the sense of chirality, whether it's plus or whether it's minus. And we call this effect the crystal hole effect because it actually accumulates all the anomalous hole effect when we have no chirality, when our state is collinear. Another type of effect, the anti-symmetric part, is what we call the chiral hole effect. And we call it chiral hole effect because it changes sign depending on the sense of chirality and it is vanishing for a collinear state. Now, this is the guy which tells us something about the chirality or the chiral state in which the system resides. Now, let's take an example and let's take a ferromagnetic Rajba model, as I said, only honeycomb lattice. And let's calculate um, the anomalous hole conductivity as a function of the Fermi energy or bent filling. And then we do the canting, plus 10 degrees, minus 10 degrees. And then you do this decomposition and you look at the symmetric part. It looks qualitatively like the normal anomalous hole effect. On the other hand, you also arrive at the chiral part, which is quite prominent. So that means that this decomposition makes sense, in particular, if you take into account the fact that two states of different chirality have no difference in the overall magnetization of your sample. That means this guy can tell you in which chiral state your system is. Now, the chiral hole effect seems to be especially prominent in antiferromagnets. And this you can see, for instance, on the example of a monolayer of antiferromagnetic strontium ruthenate. If you take a look at the band structure of this material, you see a lot of bands and there are a lot of degenerate bands. And what you do now is you do canting by a very small angle of plus five degrees or minus five degrees. Here in this plot, again, as a function of Fermi energy is the anomalous hole conductivity. And with the black line, this is the collinear state. And with the red and with the blue is the corresponding change in the anomalous hole effect with the angle. The response is truly gigantic to a relatively modest canting. And again, if you extract symmetric and anti-symmetric components, you see that this yellow symmetric part, the crystal hole effect, resembles pretty closely the collinear anomalous hole effect. On the other hand, you also observe a very large, or you could say colossal, depending on the canting, of course, chiral hole effect. Crystal hole effect, I emphasize, resembles the collinear um, anomalous hole effect, and it is not so sensitive to canting as the chiral hole effect. In fact, this effect is prominent, and it is not surprising that there has been quite a few studies where the effect of canting on the anomalous hole effect in antiferromagnets has been actually reported. The two types of effects are to some extent independent. And to convince yourself in this, consider a case of manganese 2 gold, which is a PT symmetric antiferromagnet and which thereby has no crystal hole effect. It has no anomalous hole effect in the collinear state. However, if you do the canting in the system, you will realize that there is a strong chiral response, which can be very large depending on the Fermi energy or your band feeling or whatever you want. Now, we were quite puzzled by this. And um, we wanted to go a little bit deeper and to understand maybe a little bit better the origins or the differences uh, qualitatively and fundamentally between chiral hole effect and the anomalous hole effect, which, as you remember, is given by the very curvature of K space of your Bloch electrons. So what we do here is we take a look at the anti-symmetrized Berry curvature and we express it in terms of this beast, this delta omega x, y, and we take out the linear in theta term. What we do basically is we apply a perturbation theory. And you can do this very nicely. So Fabian Lux did it. And what you realize is that the chiral response of anomalous Hall effect is a very complicated beast. In addition to the K curvature tensor or K curvature uh, properties, and to the quantum metric tensor, which is already exotic, it also includes the, what we call a mixed curvature tensor into its intrinsic structure. And we know that this mixed curvature tensor, which couples the K space 
with a staggered tilt degree of variable where we tilt the spins in a staggered way, not in a collinear way, but in a staggered way. This is the quantity which we know is related to so-called spin orbit torques. In this particular situation, this is so-called staggered mixed very curvature, and thereby it is related to staggered spin orbit torques. These are, these are the spin torques, which actually don't cause a coherent rotation of magnetization, but rather cause staggering. And this is a very interesting finding, we believe. And in fact, if you look, for example, at manganese to gold, and you plot the distribution of the chiral hole effect in response to canting, um, in the electronic structure, at band resolve, and you compare it to the calculation of a staggered spin orbit torque, you realize that this correlation is actually very close. This is also nice because the chiral hole effect can manifest in a strong nonlinear contribution to the hole effect. Here, nonlinear means that you apply electric field, you generate staggered spin orbit torques, you can't, and in the second order, this gives rise to the Hall effect, which comes on top of the collinear anomalous Hall effect in your system. Okay, um, if you look even deeper and you try to bring the symmetry arguments into play, and we all know that it is actually the, the symmetry which determines everything. Um, for, for example, for the particular case of the Rajpa model, you can do a symmetry analysis uh, or put the chiral and crystal Hall effect one next to each other to see the qualitative fundamental differences between the two. What we do here is we take our two spins and we define the staggered and the ferromagnetic components of our magnetization. And in terms of those, we can actually define our chirality. And if you do everything properly, if you correct all the terms in the expansion of your anomalous Hall conductivity, you, you can prove that the chiral Hall effect in canted ferromagnets is actually sensitive to the structural chirality, which is not the case for the crystal hole or normal hole effect. For canted antiferromagnets, it is exactly opposite. And it is the normal or crystal hole effect, which is changing sign with structural chirality, while the chiral hole effect is not sensitive to this particular aspect of your structural properties. That is quite nice and actually, in a real material, you can encounter a situation when you travel across this table in your sample, when you poke your system with external magnetic field, for instance. And a very good example here, which we have recently considered together with the group of uh, Badih Asaf, is the case of manganese bismuth telluride. The unit cell of this material is, is really monstrous, and the symmetry here is quite low. Um, however, what is interesting, what happens in, in thick stacks of this material is that when you change the magnetic field in the system, for example, in this particular case, from four Tesla to eight Tesla, you realize an antiferromagnetic to ferromagnetic phase transition. Let's say at four Tesla, you have a canted antiferromagnetic state, and at eight Tesla, you have a canted ferromagnetic state. Now, you can show that based on the crystal symmetry, of this material, the prediction would be that this canting should give the following term or the following chiral correction or chiral in some sense correction to your anomalous hole conductivity. It is proportional to the product of ferromagnetic component and the square of the staggered component of your magnetization. Basically, this means that when you are here at four Tesla and you are in the antiferromagnetic state, you are giving rise to chiral Hall effect. While on the other side of the phase diagram, when you are in the ferromagnetic canted state, what you see is the crystal Hall effect. And using the magnetic field, you can actually go through this transition and you can achieve this contribution to the anomalous Hall effect in your system. This is quite remarkable because taking into account this contribution, which I emphasize is not proportional to the magnetization of your sample. It is scaled by this component here. You can explain the field dependence of your anomalous Hall effect quite nicely, and thereby maybe one should check different materials, trying to explain features in the phase diagrams um, that you obtain, and often you interpret the humps um, in the anomalous Hall effect as due to skirmions or some textures, perhaps there is something with the chiral Hall effect here. On the other hand, 
This seems to modify also the scaling laws of the anomalous Hall effect with the magnetization. And the effect here can be rather drastic. It can be a really large effect. Okay, so I have outlined a little bit the chiral Hall effect in canted magnets and how we can use it to detect the chirality or chiral state of a particular system. You can do this not only in DC limit, which is the anomalous Hall effect, but also with kind of more optical uh, kind of effects. And I will come to this later. But the first example of optical effects, which are still linear, are the magneto optics, in particular, the Kerr and Faraday effects. Here, what we have recently shown, and here I take an example of scalar spin chirality as the quantity which determines the chirality of your state. You can use the scalar chirality to mediate the topological magneto-optical response. Now, take a look at an example of this gamma iron manganese alloy, which resides in the 3Q state when you strain it a little bit. Now, without any spin orbit interaction and without any magnetization in your sample, if you start tuning the angle theta, which basically controls the degree of canting in your system, and you look at the magneto optical strength, you will realize that the response here, the magneto optical signal, can be quite large. This is very surprising. There is no magnetization, no spin orbit interaction, and it actually does not work so well for the anomalous Hall effect in this case. But look at the theta, which provides you maximal chirality, you have a ma maximal magneto-optical response. And isn't that nice? That means that in principle, if you know your material very well, you can say in which chiral state it is residing at this particular moment. And as such, the optical probe can be also used to poke different non-collinear structures, such as skirmians, uh, frustrated systems, such as this gamma iron manganese, and beyond. This also brings us to ideas that in insulated, insulating non-caplanar antiferromagnets, we can have quantized Kerr and Faraday effects, and we can somehow even work our way along this line towards the axion electrodynamics. Another thing or another marker which can tell you something about the chirality of your sample is the orbital magnetism. And in this audience, I think, um, many people know that orbital magnetism is an emergent kind of variable. It is a little bit silly to talk about such a fundamental effect as an emergent variable. However, in spintronics, uh, people really didn't look into this too seriously. Um, and last year, you have had a talk by Dongbuk Go uh, from our group about all sorts of orbital effects, orbital hole effects, orbital Rajma effects. And a lot of things happened since then. And I motivate you to invite him again, uh, maybe next year or this year for an update. However, one thing I wanted to pick out from this pool of ideas that is out, out there is that in non-collinear magnets, when you have electrons hopping among non-collinear spins, this can have really drastic effect on the orbital magnetism that these electrons exhibit. This is what we call a topological orbital magnetism. And conceptually, it is simply a response of your orbital magnetism to a giant effective fields that you can have in strongly canted systems. This topological orbital moment is a very interesting object because besides spin chirality, it also contains information about the crystal structure and about the strength with which your electronic system kind of responds to this non-collinearity, what we call a topological orbital susceptibility. It's such this topological orbital moment is at the cross section of different kind of legs of your solids, uh, the symmetry, topology, chirality. And it is not surprising that it is also deeply related, for example, to the reciprocal space properties uh, as manifested in the very curvature of your Bloch electrons. What is also important here is that it can be a very large effect in real materials already without spin orbit interactions, as many time binding model and ab initio studies actually demonstrate. And of course, as such, it can be a signature of non-trivial chiral spin textures. But more than that, one of the very interesting manifestations, and here, this is um, mainly the, the work of Sergei Gritsuk, who has uh, shown this, 
the, if you have strong or large topological orbital moments in your system, they can actually interact with each other. And with this interaction comes a certain energy. These orbital moments can interact with each other across the lattice and also with local spins. And in the first case, what you talk about is the so-called chiral-chiral interaction, which is six order uh, in the spins. And in a way, effectively, it is what we say an orbital-orbital energy. On the other hand, the force uh, order spin interaction is what we call the spin-chiral interaction. That's an interaction of this orbital moment with the local spin. And you can think of it as a kind of chiral spin orbit interaction. This seems like a very um, nice concept. However, you might ask a question whether this actually goes that deep into the order of your spin interaction. And the answer is yes. And Sergei has shown this for um, B20 manganese germanium, where you can use first principles calculations to extract the sixth order and the fourth order. Um, topological chiral interactions to show that they're significant and that you cannot disregard them. And more ab initio studies actually follow, in particular, notably in the groups of Stefan Heinze and, uh, for instance, Hubert Ebert and um, others. Now, what is nice about these interactions is that they like to be chiral. They, they, they favor chirality. They, they want it happen. And it is therefore also not surprising that perhaps this is a key or, or one of the tools for achieving more exotic spin textures such as Hopfens. And here you don't have to go very far, uh, or actually you have to go very far in time uh, to understand why this can happen. You can take a look at the Fadeev model, um, which he has written down some 50 years ago, and where without knowing it, or rather without interpreting it in these terms as the density of chirality, or squared, or the density of topological orbital moment, you, if you minimize this model, you can actually stabilize the Hopfens. Now, I didn't talk about textures so far, but many of these things that I have discussed find their manifestation directly in the physics of spin textures. And if we start unrolling these things a little bit back, um, we can take the orbital magnetism, and then we can try to see what happens with orbital magnetism for smooth textures. Now, for smooth textures, we don't characterize anymore the spin texture with kind of local spins, but it is rather the gradients of the magnetization density that take part in all the description. And it is clear that the topological orbital moment, for instance, which is proportional to the scalar chirality, is translated into second order in gradients um, of the magnetization density kind of terms. And Fabian Lux has shown that in the limit of vanishing spin orbit interaction for free electrons, the orbital magnetism, for example, of a skirmion would be directly proportional to the exchange field or emergent field that the skirmion has and which serves as a tool to characterize the topology of this skirmion. It is a really nice finding because this constant that we had before is it's the same kind of object that you find in the description here. Something I didn't talk about in detail, but which you can also generalize is the chiral orbital magnetization. That's the magnetization which is proportional to the vector product between spins. This beast transforms into terms which are first order in the gradients of your magnetization once you go to the smooth um, limit and you reach the limit of the textures. Here, Fabian also shows that this term is directly proportional to another type of field, which is known for some time since 20 or 10 years. And this is what we call a Rajba chiral field, and which is expressed in terms of the Rajba constant and the first uh, and the gradient of the magnetization in the first order. Now, these are two terms that you have now, the chiral and topological, and in principle, they can compete with each other. Everything here depends on the electronic structure. And for example, if your Rajba constant is very large or significant, these two guys will compete with each other. And it is a question of really your texture and where you are in your electronic structure that will allow you to tell whether it is the chiral orbital magnetization or topological orbital magnetization. But in any case, there will be a strong response of your orbital moment in your texture to the details of this texture. 
This sounds very nice, however, perhaps a bit complicated because these kind of things, they appeared out of nowhere. We had some physical arguments. We were cooking up some symmetrized, anti-symmetrized things. However, there is a unified approach to this. And um, this is what we call a gradient expansion technique, which we have been applying for, for some um, uh, almost 10 years now, and which Fabian actually put uh, to the level of perfection in his um, recent works. It also allows you to look in a more fundamental way, um, more unified way at the things that are happening in textures. What is done here is that we take an object that is interesting to us, for example, the lesser green function from which we can cook up all sorts of transport properties, and we expand it in the powers of the gradient of the texture. This can be done elegantly, even though it is quite a complicated technique. If you do it, for example, for the anomalous whole effect, you immediately identify the zeros order in your um, gradient expansion as the anomalous Hall effect of your collinear system. This guy, which is second order in the gradients, is what we would call the topological Hall effect, even though it includes the terms which are beyond the simple emergent field picture. And of course, there is this first order term, which we would call the chiral Hall effect. And here it's written missing puzzle piece. Um, this is because we know anomalous Hall effect. We don't, we know topological Hall effect for skirmins. However, the chiral Hall effect for skirmins has not been seriously considered so far. And our calculations actually suggest that it emerges in complex textures, such as skirmins, vortices, bobbers. And you can do explicit calculations by taking electronic structure that you want and put the gradient expansion on top of it or express it in terms of this electronic structure to calculate, for instance, the chiral density or the density of chiral Hall effect, chiral current in the texture that you have, which you will have generated, for example, uh, by some spin dynamics or micromagnetic means. And our simulations show that these densities can be really gigantic. It is a sizable effect. And that means that it is possibly observed in many systems. And that it can tell you more than you would think about the internal structure of skirmions, bobbers, or whatever is happening inside, which are very often difficult to see with other means, such as, for example, magneto optics or X-rays. It is really a local probe which allows you to tackle these things. In fact, even when you go to the limit of most trivial chiral textures, which are the spin spiral states, and which are the states which are natural generalizations of these canted systems, which intrinsically have the chirality in them, you can show that this chiral Hall effect happens also there. And for example, Jonathan in his recent work has taken the very same model that we have been using for canted systems in the very beginning. And what he did then is he put spin spirals into this system explicitly, used cumulinear response to calculate the uh, conductivity tensor, and he did the very same symmetrization versus anti-symmetrization to extract the anti-symmetric in Q, Q is the wave vector of the spin spiral, part of your anomalous Hall effect. And the picture which emerges here, and which you see here, for instance, as a function of band filling or as a function of pitch of your spiral is extremely complex in contrast to the very uniform background of the non-chiral contributions, which basically don't tell you very much about the Q vector or in which state you are. And the situation is entirely different uh, for the chiral part. You can also generalize these things further, for example, to the chiral planar Hall effect, which you see from the very same model presented here, or even to the magnetic resistance. But it works even for these spin spiral states, which one can further confirm directly by the gradient expansion, for instance, of the continuous Rajma model, where the chiral Hall effect was also predicted. Let me make a small remark or step aside and say that the gradient expansion is actually pretty cool because it gives you also the analytical tools to understand what happens with respect to topology of, of your space, of your skirmions and your electrons. And here a direct link can be made between the physics of chiral Hall effect um, to the physics or physics or to the 
um, field of what we call a non-commutative geometry. And maybe as some of you have heard about it, but it's kind of a big thing, for instance, in nuclear physics and especially in string theory, which had been also used for understanding integer and fractional quantum Hall effect and building non-commutative gauge theories. Using the gradient expansion technique, and you should definitely invite Fabian Lux um, um, for a seminar on this and other things related to all things chiral, you can use it to bring in the non-trivial geometry of your phase space, which you have in textures, where the real space is the position in the texture, and P is actually the local Bloch kind of uh, vector variable. And you can show that the presence of the phase space of this type results in non-commutative kind of setup for your transport properties. For instance, you can formalize or you can present or rewrite the whole conductivity in terms of this beautiful expression where the normal products are replaced by the non-commutative products. This is the, how the non-commutative star product looks like. And it's a very complicated beast, which includes the gradients with respect to the real space and the reciprocal space. However, the expression is very nice because it looks exactly like kind of Kubo expression for those who know how it looks. That's why we also call it a deformed Kubo expression. Once you do that, you can start expanding further and you can arrive as in part, as a part of this adventure to the very curvature, very phase contributions to the chiral Hall effect, which are for instance, driven by kind of non-commutative monopoles in your electronic structure and which emerge again due to the combined effect or mixed effect between the real space curvature and between the reciprocal space curvature. And in this sense, the chiral Hall effect is thus also a marker of combined non-commutative R and K space geometry of your textures. And this is extremely promising, interesting, and beautiful, um, at least in our opinion. Okay, um, now I reach the last part of my talk, and I think I don't have uh, a lot to say, but one of the reasons that we actually like to look at chirality is that we believe that it is kind of topological variable. It is a robust variable, especially of out of equilibrium magnetic systems. The first time that we have realized this, or I realized this personally, is when studying the non-collinear states of magnetic chains uh, on substrates. And in this particular case, it was iron on Iridium 001 um, in collaboration with Stefan Heinz and Wiesenager Group and Kirsten von Bergman, where we have realized that actually when you have chiral state, the chirality, the vector chirality of these chains decays much slower with temperature than the scalar order between the spins. And in fact, it is not so difficult to understand because it is known for some time that the chiral correlation and the spin correlation, they behave entirely different. And actually the correlation lengths of chirality and of the spins can be qualitatively different even in terms of different kind of functional dependencies. And this mismatch is known to lead to the emergence of what we know, for example, chiral spin liquid phases. Recently, in a big collaboration with the group of Christian Good and Matthias Kloy, we have taken also this understanding or this suspicion um, uh, to the realm of, of ultra fast processes. So what was done here just briefly is taking the samples of cobalt iron boron stacks um, uh, sandwiched between tantalum, where you see this characteristic domain-like patterns, what you do is you hit it with an infrared laser pulse. This is your pump. And after that, you read off what happens with your texture with a circularly polarized X-ray free electron laser probe. And when you analyze what happens in Fourier space from the asymmetry in your signal, pretty much like from the anti-symmetric part of your whole conductivity, you can extract information about the chirality of your system. While the sum of the left and right circularly polarized signal gives you information about demagnetization. And if you put these together and you analyze this as a function of time, you will realize that chirality actually recovers much faster than the magnetization in your um, in your sample, pretty much in agreement to the understanding that we have had 
in the first part of this slide. So chirality is a faster variable. It is not so easy to kill. It will emerge back or it will come back quite quickly. The question that we can ask next is whether we can actually imprint chirality in some way, for instance, by fluctuations. Um, and can we use optical means for generating, for instance, stable chiral states in systems where there is no chirality whatsoever to start with? And can we use these transient chiral states, for example, for some sort of chiral dynamics? And I will try to quickly answer these questions. The first one is quite clear. And Li Chuan um, has been doing this during his PhD thesis. So he has proven this, and that is the following. He took the spin model, which includes Heisenberg exchange, for example, DMI interaction with the magnetic field, and he constructed a magnonic electronic structure of this model. What you look at next is the chirality of your magnonic states. And knowing this magnonic structure, you can actually calculate it. And here is an example of chirality of a particular magnonic band in the magnonic band structure of copper 13 BDC, which is a very well known Kagomi like 2D material, which is ferromagnetic, at least in plane. And then what leads to the next conclusion is that you realize that if you increase the temperature in the system, you start occupying magnets which are higher in energy. And that means you can harvest all this chirality that these magnetic bands carry. And as a function of temperature or as a function of parameters in your model, you can control the magnitude or even the sign of the chirality which you thereby imprint in your system by the temperature. This leads to the observation or speculation that with fluctuations, you can generate a whole plethora of topological electronic effects or chiral effects. And in particular, we have shown that due to this topological orbital magnetism channel, you can imprint orbital magnetism in your system by driving magnets and even generate orbital currents, which is quite nice for orbitronics applications. There are a lot of other consequences of this, including the renormalization of the G factor um, among the others, but this kind of chirality is an incoherent or gauge field like of chirality. It's difficult to get a hold of it on a specific chiral state. Next, we ask the question how to do that? And actually, the answer was not very far. Uh, it was a lot of work, but perhaps we were lucky with our model, um, which was a simple system of conduction electrons which are coupled to localized spins. So what we did is we considered finite chain of antiferromagnetic spins. It is a super simple model with just nearest neighbor hopping. And the strength of coupling to localized spins, mi is driven by some parameter j. So you work with this model. And then what you do is you hit the system by a laser pulse. So it is not a temperature effect as we will see, but it's a more controlled perturbation on your system. How we treat the problem is we um, uh, have combined protocol for solving the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. And this is done in combination with LLG equations, which work on the localized spins in this model. And like this, you can actually look at the dynamics of electrons and of localized spins at the same time after the pulse has hit your system. What is crucial here is to assume a small random deviation, uh, which initiates the process, but you realize that the electronic system actually responds almost immediately to this uh, femtosecond laser pulse. If you look at the behavior of the spins or of the magnetization, you realize here that the dynamic starts rising much further um, um, after the being hit by a laser pulse, but you also realize that you reach some stable state. Here you see the magnetization on the edge of the chain and in the middle of it. This is the consequence of the effect or action of the torque that is exerted by excited electrons in a coherent way, which changes the local direction of the magnetization. To categorize in which state you end up, we take a look at the net chirality of our system, and we realize that indeed, at the end, we have converged the components of our chirality to something. It is some chiral state of a specific chirality that we have stabilized here. What is even more remarkable is that if you look at the relative angle between neighboring spins and your average, you realize that it converges extremely fast, almost on the scale of your electronic structure.
That means that the electronic excitations effectively give the rise to what we call a spin mixing interaction. That's an effective interaction which likes to imprint the non-collinearity in the neighboring spins. And as a result of this, you end up in a certain chiral state. Here, you can ask a question, is it the effect of heating? Is it an incoherent effect? And it's easy to answer. You just simulate the effect of a laser pulse by a thermal repopulation of your states. You don't include laser pulse. You just take a bunch of electrons from unoccupied states. You put them in occupied states and you see what happens. And what happens is that the long range spin spiral order is not formed. Instead, what is formed is a bunch of kind of collinear domains, which are separated by, by short domain walls with respect to each other. And this is something that you would also assume would be a conventional treatment of demagnetization or kind of optical switching kind of experiment setup. Instead, what is happening, and this is the work pushed forward by Sumit Ghosh, is shown in this picture. For an example, of course, it's a sketch. But what happens is that in the beginning, your electrons have a strong torque, you have spin mixing interaction, you have a lot of canting, while this long range spin spiral order emerges on a longer time scale on the order of one picosecond. It's really beautiful. And what is even useful or very interesting is that since this is the coherent effect of your electronic action on your spin system, that means you can control everything here by the electronic structure parameters. For example, the hopping has a very strong effect on what kind of chirality or angle you have. The same is true with respect to the intensity of your laser pulse. And these things, these coherent things, give you a tool to engineer chirality at will. Because you know, if you want this chiral state, you have to use this type of parameters. This is a kind of chiral coherent electronic excitations, which we think, or we, that is our opinion, have been so far overlooked pretty much in ultra-fast physics of magnets, at least in the theoretical description of it. And we're looking forward in exploring the importance of these coherent excitations for interpreting demagnetization exp experiments that are being conducted either in the past or at the moment. My last scientific slide is just like um, arrow into the future. Uh, an arrow which has sent by uh, Frank Freimuth in his recent work. And that's just to emphasize or underline the statement that if you have chiral states, you can actually do many things with them because they react very differently to collinear magnets, to all sorts of perturbations. And spin spirals here are not an exclusion. I show this on the example of optical torques and optical torques are kind of torques which are exerted by laser pulses. And this is something that we have started, studied in the past. Frank has studied this in depth, for instance, for different ferromagnets. Now, what happens is that, of course, we have a certain formalism for calculating these things. And you can do material specific predictions, which tell you that, for instance, if you take iron uh, and you add the effect of spin orbit interaction, then you can generate effective fields on your magnetization by optical pulses, which are of the order of, let's say, tens of millitesla. Now, in his next experiment uh, or simulation, he takes BCC iron. He does not assume any spin orbit interaction, but instead he imprints a chiral state, a spin spiral state into this BCC iron. And what is observed is that depending, of course, on the pitch of your spiral, but even for very small pitches, the magnitude of the torques with which you can drive the spirals in your system is order or orders of magnitude larger than what you would expect from inverse Faraday effect, for instance. The optical torques on spirals can be truly gigantic. And therefore, they can really drive pronounced ultra-fast dynamics of chiral states, which, as we have seen, naturally emerge in magnetic systems exposed to the influence of laser pulses. And thereby, this means that besides the possible role in optical switching, that is perhaps a very fruitful route to explore for um, ultra-fast magnetization manipulation. So here I would like to end my talk. I think I promised 45 minutes plus minus three, and I think I'm now plus minus six. Uh, but I try to convey in my talk um, 
that the chirality is really a quantity at the intersection between very diverse kind of fields or, or pieces of solid state physics, electronic properties, non-equilibrium properties, and even very prominently topology, if you, if you wish to find it there. It gives rise to a bunch of novel effects, which are not so much explored, at least in the, in the world of conventional spintronics, such as novel interactions, novel chiral particles, generating chirality by excitations um, and possible applications for chirality detection or even novel chiral effects. And I try to motivate you to spend some time of your research on further exploring the possibilities of chiral states for various spintronics um, applications and, and beyond. Here, I would like at the end to thank the funding uh, for my topological non-electronics group, the name which didn't change since 2009. Um, most prominently, it is uh, um, our Topological Dynamics Initiative in Mainz, which is a very vibrant project and um, which we really enjoy kind of pushing uh, in Mainz and Kaiserslautern. Uh, Skirmionics, DFG on different levels, uh, Spin plus X, SFB, Elasto QMAT, and besides that, also other initiatives. And of course, first and foremost, it's the people that have done this work. And I think I've, I flashed the photos of these guys during the course of my talk. They're all great guys, and I'm sure they can give very nice talks. I've heard them, and I motivate you to invite them and listen in detail to their research. Fabian Lux, Frank Freiman, Sumit Ghosh, Nangu Go, Jonathan Kip, Sergei Gritsuk, Li Chuan and also our team in Ulich, um, Jan Philipp Hanke, and uh, our different PhD students and postdocs, Gustav Billmeier, Mariano Lejait, Stefan Blügel, as well as the group of Mang Chang Fan in Beijing, our small minds team uh, with Pascal Pras, Helen Gomonai, and Matthias Chloe group, as well as our collaborators in Siegen, Christian Good, and recently also Badi Asaf from Notre Dame uh, University. And I would like to thank you for your attention. I apologize if the talk was a little bit on the longer side. Thank you. Thank you very much, Irene, for this uh, very interesting talk. Uh, please use the reactions uh, buttons to uh, thank the speaker. And we are now ready to take questions. Please use a raise hand feature in Zoom. If you have a question, or if you're watching on Twitch, just type your question into the chat box. Um, am I going to see the questions or um, no? Uh, Jevon, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this nice talk. So I have a question regarding the second, uh, second last part. Okay. Where you showed were quite slow dynamics, mm -hmm. non-equilibrium dynamics in the time scale of one picosecond. Yes. Mm -hmm. My question is, what determine this time scale because you have very high energy of J here, right? for example, is J is one electron watt. Yeah. But the dynamics is quite slow. So only the dynamics is, yes. So the dynamics is, is, as a res, is a result of several factors, right? So also the damping uh, takes part in it. But um, the, the thing is that you excite electrons um, and it just takes some time for magnetization dynamics to kick in. Yeah, you have to work against the inertia that you have in, that you have in your in your heavy uh, ions or in your in your localized spins. Uh, the torques here are um, so I will go into full screen mode. Uh, so they are not you know they are not very large if you actually look at them. Uh, they are of the order of a couple of millivolts. And that's why it also takes a little bit of time, which is refined or tuned by the damping in your system to kick in. Yeah? So as you see, the dynamics is starting uh, almost immediately. So the magnetization, not immediately, but on the scale of uh, hundreds of uh, femtoseconds. But then things happen. Then, then it's really, it's a heavy system, which is slow. And uh, it takes some time to converge this, this collective state. Yeah. And since yes. and since the energy of the interaction which determines it 
is not that large. Uh, you can find more details about this in our paper. It, it takes longer time than, than 50 femtoseconds. That's, uh, that's how yeah, I so, so in the in the in your Hamiltonian, which parameter, if you tune it, you would see a strong so for instance, for that. So for instance, mm -hmm. it's it's the hopping. So the hopping is is one of the parameters which determines many things here, but also Heisenberg exchange. Yeah, so that's uh, these are the two key parameters which determine everything. Yeah? But of course, we, we also put damping on top of this by hand. So we don't calculate damping uh, in a self-consistent way, but we have, we have a certain damping for our uh, spin subsystem. Thank you. Oh. Okay, thank you. Uh, further questions, please. Uh, Shen, go ahead. Thank you very much for the nice talk. Uh, I have one question about the, uh, the uh, I think it's called optical chirality that you talk about. I think that's the last part of your talk. Uh, you showed that when you shine with a laser, you actually form this kind of, uh, this, uh, uh, within a very short amount of time, you follow, form this kind of chiral structure. It looks like it's periodic. So, uh, so you mean, you mean, oh, wait, let me, let me share the screen. Uh, you mean this this slide, this movie, or yes, yes. Um, uh, there there was a right. movie. Yeah, right. Yeah. So let me play it. Yeah, yeah. So it seems to form that uh, periodicity. Uh, what determines that uh, that that uh, the 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 lens for the for for this uh, for this structure? I was wondering yes. how they can measure that through uh, X rays for scattering or some kind of. Uh, Scary. Right. So, okay. um, um, so the periodicity is exactly what we call, yeah. Okay. So the periodicity is the fact that it is actually quite perfect is one of the very interesting consequences of, of our, of our analysis. Yeah. So it is really a spin spiral state, which is almost perfect in terms of the pitch. And, um, what determines the the Q or what determines the pitch. And there, there are several factors and it has to do actually with the energy redistribution. Imagine you pump a lot of energy into your system, into your magnetic system. One way, but not the only one, uh, depending on what you have spin orbit interaction and so on and so forth, to accept this energy is to form a spin spiral state. So the more energy you pump in, the larger kind of... So this, this has a correlation uh, with the pitch of, of your spin spiral, right? Because you can think in very simple terms, you have a certain spin spiral dispersion and the spin spiral of a certain Q uh, would cost you that much, that much energy in your system. So this difference is a part of what you pump into the system. At the end of the day, it is an energetic balance um, between several channels, but one of them is that. So the spin spiral um, is formed because you're accepting energy, which comes from the laser pulse into the spin spiral. This is a very, this is a very simple uh, kind of explanation. Okay. If, and uh, if, you, if you catch it. Um, it for for a, any given system, given pattern, uh, is do you only get a one periodicity, or do you get an ensemble of different uh, periodicities? Um, so let's put it like this: the electronic structure parameters, such as hopping and exchange, they determine the pitch, they determine the magnitude of chirality. Yeah, I, uh -huh. but they do not determine the, uh, at least in this model without spin orbit interaction, they do not determine the direction. So the spiral that you see here is only one possible type of spirals. There could be other spirals which look differently, but which have the same pitch and you, which you can also reach with your, um, with your pulse. Um, what is important here is in which, from which state you have started. So when you, when you have your system exposed to some fluctuations, such as temperature fluctuations, inevitably, when the pulse hits, your system is in some state which is slightly non-collinear. 
And right. this is used as a seed to imprint a certain pitch, which is driven by energetics, into this kind of pre, pre preference of your system towards a certain chiral state. Yeah? So what can be in reality is that in one sample, you might have spirals which are different, but which have similar chirality. And uh, this allows you also to think in terms of chiral, domain, uh, chi chiral domains. You can have chiral states in different parts of your sample, but these chiral states can be different. And this would be a very beautiful um, kind of realization or manifestation of this effect. Let's see. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. So I wanted to ask about these uh, states that you, you were just describing. Uh, are they metastable? Or what would be they the are? They are, lifetimes? yes. So uh, what we do not include here are the explicit electron. So there are different channels for electronic relaxations. What we have here is the damping. Uh, and due to damping, the system will ultimately return into, into initial state. It will return to the ground state from which it started from. It will come back to this antiferromagnetic model uh, that we have, you know, that we have hit. Um, and this, of course, in this model determines the ultimate time scale of when that happens. Uh, when you start including other effects, such as, for example, coupling to phonons, this can renormalize uh, the kind of time scales here that's clear. Um, however, what, what you can draw, the conclusion which you can draw is there is a strong preference of the magnetic system to have this state somehow. Yeah, so it wants to, it, it accepts this energy into the spiral state on the time scale of a couple of hundred of femtoseconds, and then it will, of course, relax. But the generation of the state is most probably there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So to understand that the uh, lifetime is uh, what, like nanoseconds? Uh, that depends very much on which system you have. So if you have ferromagnets or anti-ferromagnets here, you can you can have different numbers, but certainly nanoseconds you could you could also have. But I think you can go from 10 picoseconds to, to nanoseconds. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, it's it's really interesting finding and we're quite happy with it. Uh, it makes it makes us quite excited, I have to admit. And it, it, it is something which has not been really considered by, for example, time-dependent uh, DFT com community, because just to treat these systems, you really need a lot of computational power. So, so far, all the ultra-fast theoretical treatment, uh, at least on ab initio level, uh, DFT or some time-binding has been done for smaller unit cells, where you cannot really put a small spiral in explicitly. And this could be one of the reasons that, that nobody has seen it so far. But it's, of course, yeah, fruitful to talk to experimentalists and, uh, and so on. Would well, you expect these uh, spirals to appear in, in a bunch of different domains? Um, and if so, what would be a typical size? What would it depend on? I think the size will, will depend. So I, I, I personally do expect different chiral domains. So if it is, if it is true, if this can be proven, this would be really, really nice. And we know about chiral domains uh, from the side of antiferromagnets, where we have this chiral, um, um, like uh, Kagomi, like um, 120 degrees uh, systems, which have which can have different chirality and which have chiral domains. So um, for spin spirals, I also expect, or for larger chiral systems, I also expect that you can have those. And here, um, the factors which would determine the uh, uh, domain size are first, whether your spiral actually fits into the domain. Yeah, so this is one of the uh, determining factors. And the other one is what state you started from. So the domains mean that you had some seeds. So imagine you have, you have a gigantic magnet. It is fluctuating. To have a chiral state, we're not talking about spin orbit interaction. So spin orbit interaction, of course, will try to chiralize the things the way that it wants. So it has a DMI of some sense, and it will tell you, okay, this spiral I'm kicking out, but this one I keep. 
If you don't have spin orbit interaction, um, I'm, I didn't think about anisotropy actually, but let's assume we're in the center symmetric magnet, which is gigantic. Then you have a fluctuating system, as you have seen with these magnets. Yeah? You're at a temperature of 300 Kelvin, for example, in, in BCC iron. Um, when you look at the chirality everywhere in your, in your sample, you will see that it is actually not uniform. So there will be states with chirality, which is a little bit less locally and a little bit more, but they can be different. And I think this kind of spread of chirality is another factor or this, this chiral correlation lens, if you wish. Yeah? So the chirality is how far can it talk to the other chirality? This is another factor which determines the domain wall size. So the higher your temperature is, uh, this will favor the smaller domains actually, uh, because, uh, because you will have different seeds closer uh, in your sample. And that's a competition then, of course, between the, the pitch and the, between the energy that you pump and between the, uh, the initial state that you have. So there is quite a lot of things to play. Uh, and on average, without spin orbit, you would expect the chirality to be zero, right? You would have positive and negative. Um, that's, uh, that is a good question. So without... Um, so if you take a chain like this, yeah, so let's say you have a small chain of, of some atoms or a very small sample. Um, when it is, so I think there you can have chiral states, really. So you can, you can stabilize chiral states which are, which are stable just because your chirality is not spread too much um, uh, by the temperature fluctuations. Uh, but in a larger system, this will be probably suppressed, yes. So on average, you would have domains, if this domain picture is true overall, which, which probably kill your uh, chirality unless you have some net chirality to start with. So along this scenario of magnons that I have talked about uh, and which you can, so there, there are also different things uh, which can happen. So if you have spin orbit interaction, you have DMI. And obviously your magnonic states or your excitations will have some net chirality which fluctuates, but which doesn't change sign really. Uh, but this you can also control with magnetic field. So you can, you can probably fight this effect, for instance, with the effect of a magnetic field. Yes. If, if you understand what I'm, uh, what I'm saying. So I know I, I didn't think about this seriously, but uh, that's what comes to mind. Yeah, I mean, you would need some chiral bias introduced. Chiral bias, yeah. yes, yes. You need some chiral bias. Okay. And uh, actually, yeah, so we're, we're also thinking of uh, reinterpreting the experiments by the Isabit and the Jeff Beach group, which had recently this um, nature something paper about this generation of skirmions by, by laser pulses, by optical pulses. And there, mm -hmm. it seems that the fluctuations are also very important. And uh, there is another work which is cited in our paper at this late hour, I cannot remember the names, the science adv advances paper, which also emphasizes the role of initial fluctuating state for, uh, for the final outcome of your, of your system. Mm. So I think Branislav, for instance, for instance, could also play with these things quite easily. Branislav Mikulic um, and you guys as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, Farzad, another question? Go ahead. Yes. Hi. Uh, good talk. Hi. Can you hear me? Thanks. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I have a question uh, about your, uh, at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned about uh, staggered spin orbit torque. Uh, so I was wondering, like, can you have a staggered spin orbit torque? Is is non collinearity like crucial? Can you have like an anti-ferromagnetically ordered system the same kind of spin, uh, like staggered spin orbit torque that you mentioned? Um, so you, you don't need any non collinearity for staggered spin orbit torques. Mm -hmm. yeah, so so this these spin orbit torques appear, for example, in this collinear manganese to gold, and they're quite uh, well known, uh, meaning that they have been studied for some 10 years or, or so. 
in in antiferromagnets. You know? Yeah. So, so, so the, the, then my comment is, isn't that better to call it more accurate to call it like a spin transfer torque? Uh, why is it is it relativistic? That's my question. Frankly, like, is it relativistic? Uh, is it due to spin orbit? Not necessarily. So depending on whether you have a ferromagnet or an antiferromagnet, and whether your uh, inversion symmetry is broken or not, they can either depend or not depend on spin orbit interaction. No. Mm -hmm. So here the, it's so one of the things about these canting things is that. Uh, everything depends on the starting state. It's, it's fruitful to think of canting as a perturbation on top of some collinear state. And this collinear state determines ultimately the symmetry properties of your response tensors. Uh, you say uh, whether it makes sense to call these torques the speed like transfer, spin transfer torques. Like torque. Yeah, because if you, like in anti-ferromagnet, if you pass a curve, there would be your uh, your exchange coupling effectively would be renormalized, and that would be coming from very curvature, which is also what you have. So, but uh, when I think about that, I tend to like prefer the terminology of ter spin transfer torque light because yes, it's yes, coming so I... from very curvature too. But it's at the end of the day. It's coming from right. the fact that the two sub lattices like are right. So you are you are absolutely right, and probably in some situations it, it makes sense to 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 talk about that. Mm -hmm. So in situation where where we need spin orbit interaction for this, it is and it does not exist without spin orbit. Uh, then of course it probably makes sense to call them spin orbit torques. Mm -hmm. um, but we call them spin orbit torques just because we don't have this kind of spin transfer torque setup where we have two pieces okay. of magnets. Yeah? yeah, so we, we really have like one unit cell. Mm -hmm. yeah? And we apply an electric field. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the torques act within the within the unit cell. And uh, yeah, it's but when chain... you say spin orbit, torque, I'm sorry. When you say spin orbit torque, that means there is some sort of, you know, orbital, uh, like right. everything plays a role. So that's right. not clear to me. Yeah, right. So I, I agree. So one can one can probably change the terminology here sometimes without uh, uh, yeah. So this could be more appropriate. Absolutely. No. Okay. Uh, Jacob, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, very nice talk. Thanks, uh, Jacob. I had a question uh, for Fabian's expansion of his uh, lesser grain yeah. function. It seems to go with uh, the dis dimensionality of the system. So in, uh, in your lowest order, you have a ferromagnetic and the, the high order you have a one-dimensional chain and then you have skirmions. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me find that slide. Yeah. I think we've been looking at this slide together for years, Jacob, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, if you start going in higher orders, do you expect that dimensionality? Because it, well, for one, it doesn't seem to show anything in the sense of uh, the size of these effects do not really depend, yeah? So there's no reason for me to expect the chiral Hall effect would be smaller than the anomalous Hall effect, right? Uh, yes. Um, the thing is that um, so far, so you would expect the gradient expansion to work in the sense that when you go to higher orders, the effect should become ultimately smaller, right? Yes. yes. Um, however, by some symmetry arguments, by crafting your system, you can kill off some parts. Mm -hmm. yeah? so, for example, you could kill off the anomalous Hall effect. Yeah. Then you have just the chiral Hall effect. Or it's easy to kill the chiral Hall effect, and then you just have the topological Hall effect. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, the real strength or the relative strength of this of these effects is something which is not so easy to um, to analyze. So probably for free electrons with parabolic dispersion, you could build a relation of the type anomalous to chiral is proportional to the something, and the chiral to topological is proportional to something squared and so on and so forth. But in reality, when you take a, you know, Rashba model, and then you're somewhere with your Fermi energy close to singularity, all these things, all these kind of arguments, they go to hell. And uh, at the end of the day, 
you know, you can have topological Hall effect, which is larger uh, than the than the anomalous Hall effect and such things. Yeah. So it is very fruitful to look at these things um, from the conceptual point of view, because they tell you really about the symmetry. Mm -hmm. They tell you, so, I mean, that works like, like a peach. So you can look, you can look at these gradient expansion coefficients, and then you can apply the symmetry arguments, your crystal symmetry and so on. And you can say, this guy has to be zero. And then you calculate it, for example, with time binding or whatever. And then indeed you see that it is zero. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the gradient expansion itself, it works really for very, very large textures. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, not very, very large textures, but the, be the larger they are, the better. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So its its importance is in in kind of this conceptual, you know, like a uh, yeah, like a example or or picture or a mm -hmm. sketch of what is happening in the in the world and understanding understanding the symmetry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, thank you. And so also, second, I guess that's a two part question. <laughs> Sure. The second part was for higher order expansion. Do you are you going to expect new effects that come out, right? And are, um, are you right, to... right. That's true. So um, I think that um, that's true. Um, so I think actually, when you do explicit calculations in this type of the symmetrization, anti-symmetrization, yeah. So you calculate something as I showed. And then you switch the sign of Q as in this slide of Jonathan. Yeah. Um, you actually capture all higher order contributions mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Your, in, your, in your calculation. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, of course, yes, you are having this like, like chains of effects which penetrate further and further away from the starting. Uh, one like Kyle Hall effect, then you would have something third order and sixth order and uh, uh, sorry, third, fifth, uh, seventh, and so on. It's late, as I said. Yeah. And uh, probably they they have their physical meaning, like 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 for exchange interaction. Mm -hmm. you no. Know? Yeah. So it is probably some sort of motion of electrons, which is mediated by some sort of pinging or jumping across five spins. Yeah. Uh, which gives rise to it, and uh, so one can probably play these games for uh, for a long time. That's mm -hmm. true. Yeah. All right, thanks, uh, Akshat Mishra. Probably going to be the last question. Please go ahead. Hello. Yeah, it was a very nice talk. Uh, Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, my question is uh, in the light driven of the chiral states. Um, do you really require spin orbit coupling? What is the role of spin orbit coupling? Uh, for which, for chiral states where? Uh, the light driven uh, chiral states. The light driven. In the anti Um case. So you don't need spin orbit interaction, at least in this study that we have performed. Yeah, uh, uh, you don't need it. Uh, in the sense that if you include it, it will of course change things. And it will maybe favor other type of chirality than the one that you observe, or it will kind of stabilize to face your chirality, to, to make your chirality face in a certain direction. Uh, but conceptually, of course, depending on the strength. Yeah? So of course, when you're in a situation when your spin orbit is as large as the exchange, uh, then you can have very interesting effects. And it's, it's quite painful to even think about what can happen. Uh, but here, you don't need spin orbit. So as I said, you, you, you pick up the initial non-collinearity as a seed, and then you pump energy into it. And it kind of blossoms like it, it just, you know, it happens. The, the magic happens. Something that you would attribute to spin orbit happens due to this, what we call spin mixing interaction, which is an effective way of just rethinking the kind of non-collinearity of electrons, which, which gets enhanced by... Um, uh, by the optical pulse. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's thank uh, Yuri again.